I have a million things to talk to you about, but we do happen to be living through what I would think of as a historic event in, in terms of its impact, in terms of like almost philosophically thinking about the role of people and how they can fight power with this whole Wall Street bets and GameStop situation. Yeah. I, I was wondering, you've covered in your uh, amazing All In podcast, you guys have been having fascinating battles over this whole situation. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell maybe from your perspective, as it's unrolling, uh, the the saga of Wall Street bets and GameStop, what are some interesting insights yeah. uh, that uh, you have about this whole set of events? In full disclosure, I was an angel investor in Robinhood before they launched. And when I met the founder, Vlad, and his partner, you know, they pitched me at a, a, a bar not too far from where we are right now in Palo Alto called Antonio's Nuthouse. And my friend Adeo, it's a really good story. My friend Adeo had asked me to speak at his Founders Institute, which is kind of like an accelerator for people who are thinking about starting a company. Yes. And so I gave a talk and then he said, hey, let's go to Antonio's Nuthouse and um, we'll meet Elon for a drink. Uh, and so Elon met us for a drink there. And it's the, it's the divest of dive bars. Uh -huh. Like you'll <laughs> take a beer. I and love the will, image of all of this. You hanging out with the, Elon. It's dirt the, on the floor. A crappy bar. Yeah, I mean, it is the worst bar in the peninsula like just garbage on the floor and like cheap beer and yeah. warm beer and like you'll pick up your pint glass and be lipstick on it yeah, it's just yeah. brutal classy not your lipstick you yeah. understand somebody yes. else's lipstick yes and so we're sitting there and vlad walks up with um his partner and he says you're jason calacanis and i said tell me about your startup he said how do you know i have a startup i said you recognize me Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> I mean, that's the only way. And he goes, is that Elon Musk? And I said, yes, Elon, come say hi. And he came over and said, hi. I said, tell me what you do. He said, well, I'm a quant. And I said, what's that? And he said, quantitative analysis. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know about that. That's like, you guys make algorithms and then try to beat the market, right? And he's like, yeah. I was like, so you're gonna pitch me on a startup and you're gonna sell your algorithm to other people. And if it was so good, why wouldn't you just use it yourself and print money? He's like, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's not our business. Our business is we're going to create an app to get millennials to trade stocks. Mm -hmm. And he said, hmm, you do realize there's no retail investors anymore. Like the dot-com crash plus the 2008 financial crisis eliminated any individual's belief in participating in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's the opportunity. And I said, okay, I like it. Tell me more. He said, well, we're going to get these millennials to trade. I said, the same ones who live in their mom's basements and take Uber and Lyft and are on their no parents- money have no money, got screwed and you know went 250K into debt for school and now can't get a job. Those people? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, they have no interest in their future, but they're gonna trade stocks. He said, yeah, that's the opportunity. I was like, how, do you, how are you gonna make money? And he said, well, that's the best part. It's gonna be free. Yeah. And I said, so your idea is to get a group of people who have no interest in saving for their future to trade and your business model is free. And he said, yes. I said, I'm in. <laughs> because in almost all cases, the crazy outlandish ideas yeah. that nobody believes in are the ones that have the greatest returns. I mean, Uber, I introduced to about 25 investors and three of us said yes. So, you know, a full 12% of the community <laughs> who saw that deal decided to do it. So the, your sense about this idea being good had to do with the fact that this guy was just uh, crazy and ambitious and bold thinking, or was it that there was something here in uh, allowing a much larger magnitude of people to be able to be investors. Yeah, the way to do really well as an angel investor or just in technology or in life is to not say what could go wrong, but to say what could go right. Mm -hmm. And then to just imagine for a right. moment, if it does work, what would the world look like? And so when Elon was investing in Tesla um, and some other guys were running it and he was trying to save the company, um, you know, it wasn't, is this gonna work? It was almost positively not gonna work. Mm -hmm. It was, and he knew that. Um, but if it does work, what does the world look like? And so that's really what you're looking for is not the chances of success, but if it does succeed, does succeed, what would that look like? And you that's what the world needs more people doing. And so when you looked at Robin Hood, it was like, well, if he does succeed, what would the world look like? And now we've seen what it looks like. You have a generation who are so financially sophisticated that they know how to do puts and calls and shorts and research at a level that dominated mm. the hedge fund industry. So let's pause for a second. 
These traders sitting there on a subreddit in a Discord server are able to do analysis and research and then act in unison to say, we're going to beat, in the Robin Hood sense, uh, you know, this group of sophisticated insiders who have more access and more access to capital, but we will figure out how to solve this problem. And, you know, things, most things don't work. <laughs> it's like the Wikipedia, like, there's no way, no way the Wikipedia would ever work. Right. Except it did, yeah. right? Like you're, you're like, how is this ever going to work? You're not paying anybody, but it's built the largest corpus of an encyclopedia ever. So I think Robinhood actually succeeded. And then what we saw was this system and a lot of the systems in our society, whether it's the political system, the Constitution of the United States, uh, education, higher education, which you're involved in, uh, and then even the financial system, we have not stress tested and stress tested it, and we don't actually know all the edge cases and how it works. So Trump was able to just really put this crazy stress test. Like, it, is the democracy going to hold? Are, are we going to break this two or three, you know, 200 some odd year old experiment? And then we looked at the financial markets and it turns out there were more people shorting the stock than stocks were, than shares were available. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's possible. And then I'm trying to uncover, where can I see a list of people who've shorted the stock? And it's mm -hmm. like, you can't. But we can tell you sort of how many every two weeks or maybe twice a week we can create a report. Maybe we know. I was surprised that nobody knows the list of people who are shorted and you guys are no trying to figure that out. Yeah, there's no transparency on a lot of these systems. And if you call to try to short a stock, like it's almost like they'll tell you on the phone, like, let me see. I think I might know a guy who has shares to loan out. So it's like, am, am I calling to like try to find like a 73 Mustang Grande in, you know, gold? You know, yeah. and you're going to call around. It's like, shouldn't this be like, on a ledger somewhere yeah. and be completely transparent. So now we're seeing those things. And I think the investigations will make it super clear. But of course, in a vacuum, without information, there are so many investors in these startups that conflicts can start to appear. And then you know how it is with people in conspiracy theories. The mind starts to wander, yeah. right? And so in some cases, there is actually a conspiracy. And then in other cases, uh, people's mind will fill in like, oh my God, there's some grand conspiracy here. I can tell you Robin Hood's only goal is to get more people to trade stocks and to democratize it even more. And, mm -hmm. and they apparently were on the brink of, you know, seizing as an as an entity if they didn't get more money to cover all these trades. I mean, they were on the brink and they raised three and a half billion dollars or something like that in a week. Yeah. So in in some sense, Robin Hood enabled this very, like the magic of this distributed system of Wall Street bets, right? You, you said Wikipedia, which is another, which is probably one of my favorite websites and one of my favorite examples of like a distributed system somehow coming together in a way, just like you said at that crappy bar, you I would have guessed it would never work, but right. if it does work, it changes everything and it did. And Robin Hood in that same way, probably enabled or was one of the major enablers of Wall Street bets of giving power, uh, like empowering young kids to learn about how this whole messy financial system works and take on the big elite centralized players. Yes. And, and you know, it's very easy when these companies get big. Um, one thing that's changed is the footprint of these startups and the velocity at which they grow. So something like Airbnb is another perfect example of something that should really not work in practice, yeah. <laughs> but it does. Like, I'm gonna rent my couch or my extra room to somebody like a serial killer, or yeah. I'm gonna stay in somebody's house, like a serial killer's house. And you know, it's like it really sounds scary, but it actually works. Okay. And it and it has not destroyed the hotel business. It has added. Yeah. So the best startups induce a market to exist. If you look at, you know, Uber or Airbnb, people replace their cars. And Uber was not competing ultimately with taxis. They were competing with car ownership, public transportation, walking, or just not going out. And then you look at Airbnb, a lot of people who stay in an Airbnb would not be taking a trip to Kyoto if not for the fact that they could get a $75 beautiful room with great reviews in Kyoto for three weeks. It inspires people mm -hmm. and it manifests a market because the product is so transcendent, right? And I think that's one of the things that Robinhood did. You can't learn how to do this options trading and puts and calls and all this sophistication stuff unless you actually do it. It's just too hard to learn, except in practice, just like poker. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn how to play poker or guitar or tennis or skiing, like you could talk about it. You can watch YouTube videos, 
But at a certain point, you got to get on the mountain. At a certain point, you got to put some chips in the pot. And it's going to be painful. Yeah. Like poker is going to be painful. You're going to lose a lot of money. That's why you should play at the small tables first. And, you know, even in trading, like you look at people who are doing this crazy trading in GameStop, a company that's worth, you know, maybe a couple of billion dollars, but certainly not tens of billions of dollars. Of course, the people who are throwing their money in last are going to lose it. I think everybody knew that. Um, and so it was a momentum play and, you know, they're betting against the hedge funds. Um, so I think it's good for people to learn and become financially illiterate and just always understand the concept of the risk of ruin. Yeah. Um, the good news is for a young person, the risk of ruin might be like they lose $5,000 or something and then they have to build their stack back up. Right. But that's really the, the only thing I am concerned about is there are people who will play poker or blackjack or sports betting or whatever it is and lose control. Just like there might be people who try alcohol and lose control, yeah. but we can't build a system based upon limiting, you know, the average person's behavior based upon somebody who can't control, you know, their ability to drink, you know, two glasses of wine instead of 20.